courtesy of Brad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, I'm Dan alongside Matt once again. And Matt, it feels like deja vu. Just like we started last week's show, what a difference a week makes. Yeah, it, obviously what you have to do is our weekly predictions, pay attention to them. And just reverse whatever we say, and you're good. Who in the dressing room do you think is tasked with listening to our show and saying, boys, this is what Dan and Matt said? Time to lose this week. Oh, wait. No, time to win. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, I'd like to think it's somebody like Kevin Rooney or someone that was on the shelf for a while and had nothing else to do. Well, the Flames had three games this week, two at home, one, I guess, the closest home you can get in Edmonton. Started the week off against the Jets on February 19th. And um, this was pretty much the Calgary Flames versus Sean Monahan. Sean Monahan got a hat trick in one period, which you don't see very often. Um, I was not too convinced that the Flames were going to win after that, but somehow came back for a 6-3 win. Yeah, for whatever reason, the Flames have done rather well against Connor Hellebuck of late, um, scoring uh, five goals on him. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I thought it was a very good effort after going down 3-1. And they battled their way back quite effectively. That's the kind of game that, I don't even want to say previous versions of the team, up until last week's version of the team, that <laughs> would have like gone down 3-1 in the first and just gone home. Yep. We're good. Thanks. Right? Like Not even fun, like, everybody. oh, this is a problem we don't have this year. Like Up until you know Saturday of last week, that was still a problem. Yep. Well, sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, we just got a hat trick scored on us by our former guy. Maybe we should actually try now. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how much of it, it was because it was Monaghan. Like, how much of it yeah. was the Flames going, okay, we can't let this chump beat us. No, because then it'll be the all that you hear about for the next handful of days is, oh, Monaghan did this and this and that. That's right. Yeah, let's just end that. Oh, he also had a hat trick. Who cares? We still beat them 2-1. to one. <laughs> And I guess maybe the story here, the, his first goal of the season from Oliver Shillington, first goal of the game, first of the season for him. Um, he's. We'll talk more about him as we move through the week, but he really looks like he's back in NHL form. Yeah, and this is the Shillington we saw at the end of the season two years ago that was looking like a bona fide top four I wasn't sure who defenseman. we were going to get. Were we going to get the Oliver Shillington that for years we said, this guy's not even a number seven, time to get him out of town? Or if we were going to see the Oliver Shillington we saw just before he left? Yeah, and he really does not look like he skipped a beat. It, just uh, as good as he was right when he last played. For sure. And you're mentioning the Flames have uh, done well against Hellebuck. They played on October 11th, 5-3 win for the Flames as well. The next time they'll meet is April 4th. Then the Calgary Flames had the Buff or the Boston Bruins. Um, I was a little, I was a little worried the Bruins were going to come for revenge in this game after the way the Flames embarrassed them last time. And once again, it was not really the Flames versus the Bruins. It was the Flames versus Charlie Coyle. Charlie Coyle gets two. The Flames got two and went to overtime. And then we saw a really nice Nazem Kadri goal in overtime. What were your thoughts on this one? I thought this was one of the most exciting games all season. I thought each team played really well uh, throughout the contest. The Flames were better in the first, not as good in the second and third, but um, Boston's one of the best teams in the league. It was Just being able to hold punch. your own against Boston is important. Yeah, like you know, frankly, getting to overtime I thought was a huge success for this team. Uh, considering how good Boston was and the fact that we kicked the tar out of them two weeks ago, that, you know, like all of the things said that, like, the Flames should have lost this game, but uh, it was a gutsy effort by everybody involved. This is a game, when I think about why I don't like shootouts, this is, I think, is a great example. Two teams playing really well. If this one would have ended in a draw, I would have been okay with that. Yeah, exactly. And it would've, I would have felt kind of cheated if we went down to individual efforts to solve this one. Yeah, especially with how good each of the goaltenders was in the game. And, exactly. You know, it's games like this when I go, you know, maybe we don't need a shootout. Yeah. Well, frankly, I've never really I've never liked them either. NHL, no. But when people say, well, show me an example of why, this would be one it's game this, I point to. Yeah, exactly. And when Kadri got the start on the three-on-one, like I 
was watching it with some people and uh, I, I literally said, oh, game's over because Kadri, if you give him time and space in close, he's going to score. And that was a really excellent shot by him. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I think the fact the Flames got 30, 30 shots on goal, like, you know, that is an achievement in and of itself against what I think is one of the best D in the league. Oh, for sure. And you look at uh, some of the players on Boston that, uh, like, Flames fans literally got a bit of a scouting preview of what the Boston Bruins have available uh, because of all the rumors of Hannafin and, you know, Tanev possibly going there. Um, So, you know, that was also nice to see. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I... I don't have a lot else to say about this game. It was a really fun game. It was good to see the Flames being able to play up to their opponents, as we've talked about. And it's always nice. I mean, it feels bad when you lose, but it's always nice to see a game and see really good hockey played. And the Boston Bruins play really good hockey. Exactly. And it's the kind of hockey that you wish that the Flames would play every game. And, Not just every you know, other week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, well, talking about hockey, we'd like to see them play more regularly. Uh, Saturday night, the Battle of Alberta. The Flames take a quick trip up to Edmonton before coming back to finish their homestand. And Where Blake Coleman just decided to mug everybody and then went home. <laughs> this was like an old-school Battle of Alberta game, this one. It had pretty much everything. Like you said, Coleman got into it. We had fights. We had... You know, pretty much everything you could want as the Flames ended up being beating the Oilers 6-3. Now, Matt, when I watched this, my first thought was, you know what? The Flames know there's a game. The fans know there's a game. The broadcasters know there's a game. Who didn't tell the Oilers? Well, to be fair, the Oilers suck. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it stands to reason. You know, like a team that's actually playing well comes and just mugs them in their own barn. And the doubles them up on the score sheet. It's the first Battle of Alberta win since Game 2, which was also in February of last year for the Flames. And the Flames have now won 7 of their last 10. Yeah, and, and you look at this contest, and like the Flames basically ran away with it in the first period. We're up 3-0. Then the goal that really set off all the shenanigans in the game was the Dreisaitl elbowing Vladar in the face and not getting a penalty for it, or the goal getting waved off. I was so um, worried we were going to lose Vladar there. And honestly, if Vladar was a bit of an older goaltender, uh, what he should have done on that play is literally just lie there like he got shot. Because he literally did get elbowed in the head, and you know, make it quite apparent that like something happened it, because he got taken out of the play and while Edmonton was able to like he was able to get back in for the first shot like it, the whole situation should have been blown dead right then and there it should have been a penalty because you could clearly see on the replay that dry saddles elbow come up and clock him in the face like it, it you know, like it was pretty cut and dry goaltender interference, even though Shillington kind of edged him into the goaltender a bit. But, you know, for it to not get waved off, like it just, that, that whole situation set everything off afterwards. And yeah, I think that set it off. I mean, I don't know. I was even starting to see agitation from the Oilers when the Flames were up 3 nothing by 15 53. Like, I think, I think it was. You know, it was a lot of things that caused tension on both sides. Yeah, and then Blake Coleman uh, lined up McDavid for a rare hard body check and then slammed him to the ice, which infuriated the Oilers, and then all the fun began. You touch the dawn, you got to pay the price, right? Yep. Um, interesting note this week, the Flames got beat by only four, four scorers. Monaghan... Coyle, Hyman got two in this game, and Yanmark. Yeah. Only four guys scored against the Flames all week. But you know what? Like when I was watching this one and we saw Kadri score 202 in, I thought right there, the Flames are on it. Like something about the way they were playing, the way they're flying just told me this is going to be a good night for the Flames. Yeah. The, it Right off the hop, it seemed very much similar to their efforts against Boston. 
and they were engaged physically throughout. Um, you saw Jonathan Huberdo throwing multiple body checks in the game and him really engaging, which is nice to see, especially over the last few weeks. He's really turned it on. He has 20 points in his last 21 games, which, you know, that's the Huberdo that you're paying $10 million for. And, you know, any time that he's engaging physically, that you know he's in some ways like any really top end player if they're engaged physically they will be scoring as well we're getting you know setting up good chances and i thought he was dangerous all night yeah i mean this looked more like the jonathan huberto we're used to from florida than the one that looked lost last year yeah which is good to see and i'm hoping that this is just him turning the corner over the last 20 games and you know, reestablishing how good of a player he actually is. So as you mentioned, Dan Vladar in net for this one. Interesting, the last time he played was a month ago, also against the Oilers. Um, Andre Kuzmenko out of the lineup for this one. Instead, we saw Dryden Hunt draw in and drew in on a line with Huberto Sharangovich, even got his first goal of the season um, in this one. Well, well, let's talk about Dryden Hunt while we're here. Like, this is a guy who the Flames brought in um, at the trade deadline. He was part of the... Was he part of the Stetcher trade? I think he was. No, uh, he was just acquired off of Toronto for some... One of our defense prospects or something, or future considerations. Oh, it was a minor Zahorna. Deal. Zahorna, um, there you go. Dryden Hunt to the Flames in exchange for Zahorna, which I don't even know where he's at these days. Uh, he's back in Pittsburgh. Okay. Um... And you know a guy that yeah he had a, he had a fun year. He went from Pittsburgh to Calgary to Toronto back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Obviously, you're destined to just stay there. Yep. Um, and I mean Zorn is a guy we liked in his time as a Flame. Dryden Hunts looked good in the American League level. I thought that he honestly could have been the 13th forward this year. I mean, this is an older player. He's he's I think 27 right now. So a guy who you know what you're going to get in in this player. He doesn't have a lot to prove. 28. Um, I was surprised to see him play as high in the lineup as he as he did, but I mean, this is a guy who looks like if he can keep playing like that, he's going to stay in in Calgary. Well, I shouldn't say Calgary, be in Calgary either way. He'll stay with the Flames. Yeah. Well, and the Flames have had a long track record of guys like this, whether it was like Jamie Lundmark or Austin Zarnick or you know, like any of that type of guy who's. Decent enough defensively, can chip in a little offense here and there, but not necessarily a full-time NHLer, but just serviceable. And, you know, he's been a very good player for uh, the Wranglers. And, you know, if uh, necessary, he can easily draw in on the Flames when a guy like Kuzmenko's out with I also think the definition of full-time NHLer is about to change for the Flames. They go into their retool. True. Right? I mean, I think Dryden Hunt is definitely, I would say definitely could hold down a top 13 forward spot. Is he in my top 12 on a Stanley Cup team? Probably not. Is he on my top 12 on a team that's going to finish in the bottom 10? Sure. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I think that there, and he's a Calgary boy too. What was the story? I'm trying to remember from last year. I think he had a place in Calgary and Uyghur was staying at his place after Uyghur came here. And then he got signed. He told Weger, you're making some money. Go find your own place. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, a guy who's from Calgary, who lives in Calgary, a guy I think they'll probably want to keep around for that reason. Um, so what you're saying is that we found the new Michael Stone. Well, I don't know. I don't know. We haven't seen him not play for, you know, three months and see what he can still do. True. True. Right. That was always the thing about Stone, right? Is Stone could go like half a season without playing and come in and not miss a step. Um, but I mean, if they want to keep Dryden Hunt around in a second, you know, I wouldn't say a second line guy forever, but you know, in sort of that second grouping of forwards, that third, fourth extra forward role, I think that's fine. And at the same time, if he's working with Sharon Govich and Hubert Owen, it's too, too early to say after a game, but if he fits there, I mean, I'd argue Pospisil's played higher in the lineup than he should, but he fits with the guys he's playing with. Like, if you find the right chemistry, you keep him there. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Pospisil's not a top know. six forward for a, a deep team either. No. Uh, basically, Pospisil is 
this group's version of Michael Furland. Where, I, mean, I don't uh, think any of us uh, even expected Possible to make the team this year, or even get a call up of all the guys, much less be here all year. Yeah, and then be one of the best two way forwards in the league, which is like, okay. <laughs> Um, but he, he quickly is making a name for himself and really is earning the reputation for being, you know, the same type of player as Furland was. And maybe that's what I like about Dryden Huntley. He doesn't just seem like generic AHL player number 14 to get called up, which how often do we see that? He's, I would say, already creating a bit of his own identity. He's fast. I think he's got a good read of the game based on the way we saw him um, We saw him playing. And I think that he could, and we've seen this a little bit in the in his time in the American League too, I think that he can be more of a puck mover. Well, and this is one of those where it helps having depth, where you can pick specific guys for specific roles on the recall. Like if you have a top six forward that goes down, you can easily so- slot Coronado. Hunt in for... Oh. A couple of games you can slot a Coronado in um, you know and if you need more of a physical angle that there's a whole handful of guys there as well for like the third and fourth lines and you can yeah, plug Amelia and play Patterson, depending on what you need lots of guys you yeah can pull up. yeah so it's nice to have that flexibility where you can just literally drop somebody in and not disrupt all the lines just to shoehorn somebody in. I guess when I look back I was not expecting the Dan Vladar and Dryden Hunt would be sort of the talk of the of the Battle of Alberta. Yeah. So I got it wrong here. Dryden Hunt is from Cranbrook, um, but I think he's been living in Calgary. Undrafted six foot player. He's twenty eight years old. But yeah, I mean, good for him. Uh, what was it that Daryl Sutter said last year? When you get the opportunity, make the most of it. Yep. And that's and he he's bounced around the league a bit. He's played on three teams and. You know, not for long with each, nope. but, you know, he's been a serviceable NHL player. Yeah, he played wherever he's gone. In 2021-22, he played 76 games with the Rangers, uh, 17 points. Otherwise, he's played kind of 20, 30 games maximum every year. But, yeah, he's played for Florida. He's played for the Coyotes. He's played for the Rangers, the Avalanche, the Leafs, and now the Flames. Um, a typical, I, I think more and more we're seeing this in the stand, in the um, salary cap age. These kind of guys that are good enough to be in the league, but nobody wants to, you know, give a raise to. So you just kind of float from team to team. Yep. Dan Vladar, let's talk about him a little bit before we leave the Battle of Alberta. Like I said this to you that I think if markstrom gets traded at the deadline which i'm still not sure he's going to but if he does i think you've got to give the net to dan vladar for the rest of the season to see what you've got in him you can't just call wolf up and say okay it's wolf's net and after seeing a game like the one in edmonton i think that there is something to dan vladar and i know a lot of people have said he's the guy to trade but more and more when i see him as a young goalie i think you know what this is a guy that i'm not saying we can develop him to be the next Kippersoff or Waugh or even Markstrom, but going into the period the Flames are entering with their retool, this is a guy I think you got to keep around. Like he's looking a lot more comfortable than he did even last year. Yeah, and like uh, basically how he's playing thus far this year and last is more or less reminiscent of like what Kari Ramo brought when we're just serviceable. You know, he's not going to blow you away all the time. He can win you a game here and there. Um, and just solid and steady. And, you know, what what his ceiling is, like, is he a bona fide starter? Who knows? But uh, And again, I think bona fide starter depends on where that team is. Yeah. Uh, but, is he a bona fide you know, starter for, you know, the Boston Bruins? No. Is he a bona fide starter for the Oilers? Sure. Um yeah, <laughs> you know they they need some well, goaltending. Well, well, Edmonton's a, a whole different problem. There's like forty goaltenders better than what they've got. So but. you know, I and I think with a thirty-two team league, which means there's what sixty-four goaltending jobs. Yeah, I think he could probably be a starter in a thirty-two team league. Yeah, and it's one of those where. Like, frankly, over the next few years, like, the Flames are going to need to weaponize cap space more than anything and be able to either eat or facilitate bad contracts on other teams 
in order to gain additional assets, like pulling them on a hand trade in reverse. Um, and it it's one of those where, you know, having a $6 million goaltender in Markstrom versus like a three-ish million dollar goaltender likely for Vladar when he's doing Yeah, he's new making 2-2 two, two right now for this year and next year. But, you know, like after that, like he's going to be only like a three, three and a half, maybe a four million dollar goalie if he's playing really well. Like all of that, you know, savings that you're getting, like you can use for other things. And I, I feel that um, for what this team needs, the step down from Markstrom to Vladar is not a, a big enough one to dissuade you from moving Markstrom if you choose to. No, and I mean, Vladar's 26. He's probably coming into his prime as a goaltender in the next couple of years. By the time he finishes his deals of flame, he's going to be 28. Who knows if he'd even want to stick around? Like, you know, if he's proving he's a great goalie, he might want to go get a payday or, you know, get a playoff run elsewhere. And I wouldn't blame him at that 3 million level. But, you know, we've got yeah. the time now. Let's see what the kids got. Oh, yeah. And frankly, the Flames are in a, a good position to give him the runway to figure himself out. Like, um, you know, the guy who's getting his jersey retired next week, um, you know, he uh, was the third stringer on San Jose and didn't really get any much of an opportunity. Calgary had nothing but goalie injuries, and so here, have the net. And, you know, he turned into a player getting a jersey retired. Not saying Vladar is going to materialize into that but you know having the runway to you know well, that's it. If nobody either gave throw down the runway, or not, we wouldn't have known what he was capable of and you know vladar getting some runway you know you never know and he's a huge goaltender and if he can turn into something good hey awesome and it seems like the team in front of him has more confidence this year too yeah i think the goalie well, staff the coaching staff and the team all seem to have a lot more confidence in him yeah, well, he's not losing his net nearly as much as he was last year. Um, like, he's very much more contained. And it, it's taking a lot more for the other teams to actually beat him. Like, he's not really giving up bad goals. You know, like, even if you look at the goals that the Oilers scored, like, all three were, you know, full-value goals by the Oilers. There was no easy ones. That's true. So... Well, before we move on, let's look at where the Flames are this week. After 58 games, they have 28 wins, 25 losses, and 5 OT losses. So let's call it 28 and 30. Um, 61 points, which puts them behind Minnesota and St. Louis for the wildcard race. So right now, Nashville and L.A. have the two wildcard spots, 68 and 64 points. St. Louis, 62. Minnesota, 62. Calgary, 61. So they're both in it and out of it at the same time. Yeah. And realistically, because of the fact that the flames are three points out of a playoff spot and you have to leapfrog three teams, it's hard. It's not impossible. It's just very hard. And then hard you got Seattle do. with 59. So they're what? One win away from us. Yeah. Like you look at like how good the flames have been over the last 10 games. They're seven and three, which is really impressive. They've only managed to make up three points on Nashville. Yep. Over the last 10 games. Like, you know, so like they'd need to have another seven and three with Minnesota being, or Nashville being as good as they've been just to tie them, which they also have the tiebreaker on us. Like, that's where it gets into increasing levels of difficulty just to, you know, leapfrog other teams. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's at the end of the year. I think that's going to be what's most frustrating for Flames fans is that they were so close yet, so realistically so far. Yeah, realistically so far out. Like the Flames, like you said, you know, they they get an inch and then they give up a mile, and then they get an inch and they give up a mile, and that's what middling teams do, right? They go on streaks, they win, they lose. I mean, if you're a good team, everybody loses, but you don't go on these protracted losing streaks like the Flames do, that's why they're a middling team. And I think that's going to be what this season's remembered for, is just this, yeah, like you said, being so close, but yeah, being so far at the same time. Yeah, and like we're seeing like the same group of teams like lumping up uh, for like even the draft spots where like there's not a ton of separation between us and like 
the bottom six or seven teams either, so it's one of those where, like, if the Flames do trade a Markstrom, a Hannafin, a Tanev, like, the Flames are going to fall in standings just natural due course, so it's not hard to fall right into a bottom five pick as well, and, you know, it's frustrating, but at least the team seems to be going the route of selling regardless of how yeah I, I don't think you can change your uh your plan at this point you can't say well we're close let's keep these guys and go on a run because even as you and i have said if you do make it to the first round you're not making it out of the first round this year oh no like oh gee you get to be either colorado or vancouver's whipping boy in the first round well that that's exciting <laughs> you know like what maybe five games in each either case and what's it and what's out, the like, point in keeping those guys for those five games yeah like uh, give me all the draft picks and yeah and you know what if the flames and... still make it after they make these trades with whoever's in the roster great gives us some playoff experience but you know i think we all know this year the flames are not destined to be a playoff team and i mean last year they were close too and i'd say arguably last year they had a worse year yeah and you know i think just the way the nhl is there's the good, there's the bad, and then there's this mushy middle now. And you, I think there's, you know, every year there's three or four teams that are close but not at the same time because they're all just battling for, you know, one spot. Yeah, and, like, realistically, um, you know, like, there's the five or six teams that are at the very top of the standings uh, in the East and the West, and then it's kind of like everybody else in the middle, and... Um, you know, and you know that likely the cup's going to one of those five teams and, you know, it's not overly exciting no. <laughs> in terms of, you know, like Calgary, you know, even if they managed to somehow leapfrog the Oilers into the third spot, well, then they'd play Vegas, which, yeah, like that's Yeah, just and as... to me, they haven't demonstrated that, you know, yeah, okay, they play good against good teams, but they're so inconsistent. Like, they, yeah. they haven't demonstrated to me they're going to make it out of round one. No. You know, and... And realistically, with where this team is organizationally, it's better for them to not make it, even though that's... Yep, I agree. It sucks. Short-term pain for long-term gain, right? Yeah. Don't make it. Send some guys down to the American League to have a good run for the, the Calder Trophy there, um, or the Calder Cup there, and... Go, you know, go through this process. But I think last time we tried to short circus this process, it cost us 10 years of middle hockey. Yeah. Well, and that's middle of the firmly pack, why, say. yeah, firmly why I think no Canadian team has won since 1993 is that all of the Canadian teams have that pressure to just, you know, make the playoffs and shoot for the best, which doesn't actually net you necessarily the best results either and you know everybody kind of circles that same drain too I agree. And... well let's move away from the week that was and uh well i guess partially the week that was but let's talk about kuzmenko kuzmenko came in looked really good with huberto he's moved up and down the lineup he's played first line he's played fourth line he's played all over he did not play against edmonton the coach said that he wasn't 100 percent I'm seeing a lot of chatter online uh, from fans saying, oh, Kuzmenko is on the fourth line. He's not looking the way that we expect him to. Did we get a bum deal? I'll give you my thoughts on this first, Matt, and then I'll let you give yours. If Kuzmenko is so sick that he's out, I don't think that that just came all of a sudden. I think he might have been battling something over the last week, and maybe that's why the team was trying to limit his minutes. Maybe that's why he didn't look good. We know what this guy's got. You know, It's not like he comes to Calgary and he's just going to completely look different. I think it'll take some time for Kuzmenko to figure out his place in the system and the flame system and how he fits in here. So, yeah, I don't necessarily expect him to be a first-line guy all the time. I mean, look at Sharon Govich, right? Sharon Govich came in, took him some time to find his spot here. He started on the fourth line. Now he's one of our most valuable forwards. I think you're going to see the same with Kuzmenko. But we have time now, and I think we just need to give Andre Kuzmenko some time to figure out where he's at, get healthy, and do his thing. Well, and realistically, um, Kuzmenko is kind of the cost of doing business as well for as good of a return of the other parts 
of the Lindholm trade. Like, if you're not taking Kuzmenko's contract back, like, it, it, the return that you get is probably just the first and maybe Yermo, um, instead of getting Brustevich, who's a really exceptional D prospect, in addition to uh, Kuzmenko, who could rebound, could not. You know, he, he's a very much yeah. a wild card. And but I still expect him to be better than a fourth-line guy. No, true. And it's also one of those same situations that, um, like, I've brought up with Manjapane of, like, he's a one-third buyout as well if the Flames decide to go that route. Yeah, one year, I don't think which you buy I, him out. No, it, it's one of those where that is an actual possibility in the you'll, same you'll manner You'll have the money, but, I think you hang on to him. Um, and, I mean, a lot of people thought there might even be a prospect to flip him. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's one of those where if those two guys play well next year, then you obviously just pull the same deal at the deadline. Well, as, and the biggest you know. thing, too, is the boys seem to like Kuzmenko. Like, he's a fun guy. They like hanging out with him. So I think even if for nothing else, if you can afford it, you keep him for what he is in the room. Yep. He seems like a bit of a goofy dude. Yep, which... You know, the Flames need Probably to lighten need, up. Yep. And, and uh, like I frankly, said... Frankly, they need need some more personality, frankly. and Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the good teams in the league always look like they're having fun. And you listen to their interviews, and they sound like they're having fun. The Flames haven't been that way for a number of years. Yeah. You know, and I mean, when Daryl came in, you know that there's not going to be a lot of fun there. And I just feel like, you know, if a guy like that can help lighten the mood... He's worth keeping around, but I'm not worried. Like, you know, fans have said, you know, oh my gosh, he's on the fourth line. What is he? I think he's going to be as advertised. And again, looking at where the Flames are at, they're not a deep playoff team. We'll all admit that. I mean, you know, I think he's got a spot in your top six. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where, you know, uh, the uh, Huska's shown all year that if a player is not playing well, he gets shifted down, and like a corresponding player who is playing well gets Jordan bumped Hunt. up. Exactly, and it's one of those situations where, you know, if Kuzmenko is playing well, he will get the ice mm -hmm. time, and he'll probably start most, if not every game, on the Huberdo line. Yep. And then as the game evolves... Yeah, Pelty is not adjust. looking really great on that line. Dryden Hunt's looking okay, but I still like the Kuzmenko fit best yeah well realistically Peltier needs to be healthy and actually just get some minutes uh, and get his legs under him um you know that one's I, uh, that was something we want we had planned to talk about but let's go to Peltier quickly here like he came off an injury then he got hurt again I'm starting to worry that this kid and we we see guys like this in the NHL and it hurts me so much when it happens to my team but he might be one of these guys that's perpetually injured and never is fully healthy well, and th that's the thing that it's hard to tell. And he's had a couple of injuries now, and whether that hinders him long term or it's just a bump in the road, just random freak accident, and you know he he never has another long term injury for the rest of his career. You don't know, but uh, he just needs to be able to just play for a while and not have to um, worry about. Uh, being off the ice more so than anything and just getting the reps in at the NHL level. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, if, again, I think the Flames have some flexibility and if they need to, I'd be okay if Peltier went back to the American League. I agree. You know, send him back down. I think, you know, one thing we got to find a spot for next year too is Coronado. I mean, where does he fit in this whole picture? We won't have that discussion today, but... You know, the Flames have a lot of forwards in the lineup. I could totally see Peltier go down, Coronado come up next year. I think if Mangiapane's not here, which you think he might not be, Kuzmenko fills his spot really well. Like, But they've got too many forwards right now. Yeah, and that's some good flexibility. Um, it's also, it, like, especially because, like, the team's not looking like they're going to be... Uh, going gangbusters on free agency day to like plug holes like they need serviceable NHL players and having enough to cover your base while you're basically letting the prospects cook in the AHL and whatever junior league they're in will just help the team until those guys are ready to go and 
you know, because, uh, like, realistically, the most important players for the Flames moving forward aren't even on the Flames right now. And we got to wait for those guys to develop yes. properly. Yeah, I just, I don't know what to make of Pelton. Like you said, it might just be a year of bad luck, but we see this often where there's one young guy who just gets his career hindered by injuries. And right now, I think the best thing for Peltier might be to send him back to the Wranglers. A lot of, I don't even think you got to bring anybody up. I mean, if you want to, great. But put Kuzmenko in his spot, send Peltier down, and just get him going again at the American League level. Yeah, and like we even saw that with Sean Monahan. Like, you know, he was looking well on the path to being like a four or 500 goal scorer in the NHL over his career. And then, you know, he hits 28 and then all the injuries happen. And that's a good comparison. I was just talking to somebody about that during the jets game. Said, why did they get rid of Monaghan? Well, he was broken at the time. Yeah. And not guaranteed. And, you know, and like, that's why that trade made sense at the time was that you're basically replacing a broken version of Monaghan mm-hmm. with an actual healthy version of Monaghan production wise in getting Nazim Kadri and it just costs you a first round draft pick to swap out yeah. the, the, the broken guy for the Yeah, because I mean guy. we weren't sure if he'd ever play again and we were paying him six million. Yeah, and you know, at the time the Flames were in, you know, still in like playoff contender ish mode, so you know and, you had to make the move. Yep. Another guy that I think, you know, we're not talking about as we talk about UFAs and moving this, you know, guys next year is Oliver Shillington. And he's also UFA. He's the last UFA, I'd say, of note that nobody's talking about. We're not going to, you know, the Flames aren't going to go and move Osterley or guys like that. But Shillington is, his contract is up. And I think he's made a play that he should stay with the team for next year. I fully expect him to be signed. What I'm not sure of, though, is what his comparable is. Like, he's a 27-year-old defenseman. He hadn't played for 20 months, so he probably doesn't have the same mileage on his body most 27-year-olds do. He's making 2.5 right now. If I were the Flames, I don't think I could make a lot of case for paying him more. In fact, I'd almost say to his agent, like, he almost owes us some time, if that makes sense. Like, we paid this guy to not play $2.5 million. I don't know what his next contract looks like. What do you think? Well, realistically, this is a player um, where I wouldn't mind if the Flames decide to do something a little weird and pay him like four or four and a half million dollars, but like make it like a five or six year deal. Um, The reason being is that you're kind of expecting him to be a, a transitional good second line second pairing defenseman for your team and he is showing enough where you know and how do you say it's like yes um you know like uh, he does owe the team a little bit for you know being able to have the time off to deal with his issues but i think it's a also uh, mutually beneficial because you know like if he plays as well as he has like he is a four million dollar defense i don't know other teams are going to pay him four million though no if he hits the open it, market i don't think he'll make that no but it's also um how do you say it? as tough as it sounds it's hard going through a rebuild and keeping free agents and like you kind of have to slightly overpay to a degree, and there is enough of a good relationship between Shillington and the city of Calgary, period, because of how well our fan base has supported him through the whole entirety of everything, that, you know, I'm sure that there's a mutual interest in staying, and I'm thinking that, like, for the longer term, having him on a longer term deal at a slightly lesser cap hit than, you know, he might get if he was you know, walking into this contract as, like, the four, you know, the number three, four defenseman that he's playing, like... See, to me, an overpayment, that would be, like, 3-2. Like, I I don't know he's worth much more than the 2-5 he's making now, because for all we know, he's not going to play again next year. Like, we don't know what he's got, right? So I think you're taking a risk, and I think the Flames are going to have to be compensated for that risk if they're going to take him. Like, I think three is the highest you could justifiably go on this guy. 
I I would not be surprised if they get if they do like two eight for two years. Yeah, and the reason why like I, I was saying like four four and a half over like longer term is for the longer term of the contract because like on a short deal, yeah, like two and a half, two eight, three. That's and I don't know if he's gonna right. want to do long term. No, and that's also understandable. You know, knowing as well. where the flames are going to be and still being a young defenseman, I don't know if I'd want to lock up and you know until I'm over thirty. Well, and that's one of those. You know, it just depends. And I I think that this is one of those where you don't quite have to worry about the contract so much as that because I think both sides will be motivated to get a deal done. Yeah, he. Um, I mean. No other team, I think, is going to take the risk on him as a free agent at any decent salary. I think he knows he's coming back to Calgary because Calgary loves him. He loves the organization. They, you know, they work well together. The amount of, yeah, the amount of respect that, that both the fan base and the organization gave him during his issues that he had, you know, like that matters a lot. For sure. You know, and, you know, because we treated him right and you know it's a mutually beneficial thing and i, I also don't want to hinder the flames down the road with a four million dollar salary that we might regret true it, it that's where it's kind of tough but and if you look at most teams going through that rebuild they're not signing six seven year deals anymore they're signing three four year deals yeah and that's where like i could see like a four sixteen deal yeah, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go anywhere near that high. I think to me, three five would be high. Yeah, I think you you got to try and get this guy under three. And I don't think he's got a lot of. I mean, this is going to sound maybe rude or crass, but I don't think he's got a lot of leverage in bargaining. No, this is also going to sound a little weird. In my opinion, this contract negotiation isn't necessarily about Shillington. <laughs> it, it's also. Kind of like uh, sending a signal to all players that, you know, like regardless of what your situation is, like we will actually treat you fairly. Yeah, and I think even paying him the same would be treating him fairly. I mean, yeah, if the Flames it, come out and say, look, take 800000 to come back, that's not treating him fairly. No. And it, it's one of those, like, when the contract gets worked out, I think that, like... I don't foresee any scenario in terms of dollar or term that would be controversial. Um, Cause like, you're not obviously going to like offer him like a $6 million contract or anything, you know, outlandish like that or, you know, like sub two either. So like it's what, yeah. So, I mean, you're thinking four is the highest. I'm thinking three, three, five is the highest. We'll, we'll see what he comes in at. This is a great example to me though, of, where I wish we could have more contract incentives. Like he would be a great guy. And we, there was more of this before the, uh, before the lockout. But if you kind of say, okay, we're going to give you a base rate of let's say two and you can earn your way up to four. I think for a guy like him, that's, that'd be a fantastic way. Yeah, to structure make a deal. The, yeah. And make the like incentives easy enough for him to actually, you know, easy enough, well, but you still want him to be pushing himself, make him earn them. Well, yeah, exactly. Like, easy enough in terms of, like, you know, like, having, like, eight or ten goals or, you know, like, 30 points. You know, like, where you actually have to be playing well enough in order to earn that. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's not incentive-based if you're not going to hit the incentives, right? I mean, he was in 2021-22, he had 31 goals for the team, so... In, or sorry, 31 points, nine goals, 22 assists. So yeah, I think you could say get to 30 again or you make it 35 and we'll pay you. Or, you know what, stay healthy for, you know, 60 games and we'll pay you. Yeah. Like I, I just, this would be, I think, a good example and we can't do it anymore, but I think this would be a good example of where an incentive laden deal could really do well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you can't make them too easy. Like, oh, you took a shift, here's $10,000. Well, that that's the kind of contract you see in baseball a lot of, oh, you actually played like 20 games. Here's a million dollars. I think that's if like, you're going to do it in the NHL, you'd have to kind of have a list of preset. These are the incentives you're allowed to use, you know, yeah. and you can put your own dollar value on them, but these are the incentives you're allowed to use. 
Which would make sense. Yeah, otherwise you're going to get Standardize the, it, yeah. Otherwise you'll get the, yeah, you took warm-up skate for one game. Woo, here's 10,000. You told Kerry Fraser off. Here's 500,000. And the other <laughs> issue you'd have to figure out is how you'd fit those under the cap, right? I think you'd almost have to go over the cap and then make it a penalty for the next year. I don't know. I'm not the commissioner. I'm too tall to be the commissioner. Yeah. Um, before we get to... Well, okay. Another thing I'll ask you then is... I was watching the the Battle of Alberta. I'm not a huge fan of the outdoor game jerseys, but the one thing I did like is the red helmet with the light jersey. And we're seeing San Jose do this where they were in their teal on the road. We're seeing the Carolina Hurricanes do this where they are uh, wearing their red on the on the road. It made me wonder. I wonder how it would look with red helmets for the Flames on the road. I actually think it would be pretty smart looking. What do you think? Well, I I find it works better with the heritage kind of jersey where like the white on it is not like white white um so it's it feels more of a natural blend the ones where it's like the color on like the stark white i tend to be feel that it's just a little too jarring differentially i think it depends like i like san jose's because i think the teal no one else is wearing and their pants are the teal and I think there's not enough teal in their away jersey that it feels like you're overdoing it. Yeah. So I think it works well there. I think there's some teams where you've got like, you know, the whole arm in a different color and it'd be too much of that color. But when I look at San Jose's jersey pattern in Calgary's, like on our road jerseys, we have the yoke on the top and the stripe on the bottom of the arms and the chest. I think the red could actually go well there. I think a lot of fans here would not want it because it's not the we've made it a big point as an organization here of going back to the classics and going back to the retro and it's not the retro. So I don't know how it would go over with the fan base, but I'd be open to trying it. Yeah, uh, like you said, like I'd be open to trying it. I just don't think that it would look as good as it does with the outdoor game jersey. And I think with a new jersey manufacturer next year for the NHL, you're probably going to see in the next couple of years all the jerseys redesigned because that's what tends to happen in this league when a new jersey manufacturer comes in. I would not be surprised, Matt, if we end up seeing uh, dark helmets with every newly designed away jersey. Yeah. Well, and frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing uh, less white jerseys, period. I think that, you know, uh, we've seen like color on color, you know, and I think that you'll start seeing that a little bit more than as well. Yeah, I'm just flipping through NHL jerseys here. There's some jerseys, I think, the, the dark, like Seattle's jersey, where the dark blue is minimal compared to the light blue. I think the dark helmet would look really nice. Calgary, I think you could do it. I think um, there's some teams that you just couldn't do it with. Like, you know, Chicago has the black pants. I don't think you want a black jersey there. And the idea is always the jersey matches the pants. Uh, Florida, I think, has too much. Well, they have enough red. You could probably do the blue helmet. But um, a team like Dallas, I don't think it would look as good. L.A., I don't know if it would look as good. I know they've worn their shiny helmet a few times with their white jersey. I'm not a fan of that. Um, New Jersey, I think, has too much red and black in their jersey already. Like, I don't know. I think there's certain yeah. uniforms it works well for, and I think Calgary's. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing it. Like, I think it might look better than we think it's going to. Yeah. Um, also, uh, just as a point of note, apparently uh, in Major League Baseball, um, they're the first ones to go under the Fanatics banner for oh, yeah, their they're new jerseys. With them. Yeah, and they're apparently like Walmart level jerseys, but worse. I was looking at some pictures on Twitter where even like the guy's numbers weren't lined up and stuff like that. It's like, um, you're a professional league. Um, Maybe you should hire professionals to actually manufacture your jerseys. Yeah. Uh, Well, and and hopefully (laughs) hopefully the MLB will get all the bugs out of the system. Yeah. Um, well, uh, next year the NHL is going to be having the same fun because that's. Gonna but be that's the NHL's what I mean. Hopefully they get the so. manufacturing process figured out before the NHL hits it. Yeah, because um, there's a few more yeah, challenges in the MLB jersey. They open at the front and the letters aren't lining up. Like we don't need to worry about that as much. But the fact that even the numbers aren't straight and the the MLB too has more curved names. But the fact that the the numbers aren't lining up, it, that's like that's jersey making one on one. Yeah. 
Even when like I watch the guy at you know the store in the mall here, he uses a level and a ruler to get those lined up. I know, like it's that's bad. Like unless you're the, the New York Islanders with the fist stick jersey, uh, you know that's the, the only excuse for having the numbers crooked. <laughs> yeah, and and that was by design. Yeah. Right, and I don't think anybody but the Rangers has curved number or curved names anymore in the league. No. Does Detroit still? Still do curved names? Yeah, they do. Yeah. So the, I think those are the two teams that have curved names. But Fanatics and all do that from baseball. But you're right. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm worried about the Fanatics jerseys. But, like, think about every other time they've changed jersey manufacturer. They've either done things like the reverse retro to make some more money or they've redesigned the whole jersey. Like, when, you know, we got the the Adidas or what was it, RBK come in and did the Jersey with the vertical striping or, for the flames. Like I'm, I'm expecting in the next three to four years here, a league wide redevelopment. And if that happens, I think we'll see dark helmets on the road. Yeah, I agree. Last note here, before we get to a, a better topic is uh former flame, Adam Rajichka, who was recently claimed by waivers off waivers by the Arizona coyotes posted a video on social media this past week that begins with the camera pointed towards a small plate, which had a white substance on it. The 24 year old Slovakian then pans to himself for several seconds and puts an object in his mouth that I couldn't tell what it was. I don't know if you could, I don't know if it's a, didn't look like a cigar. I'm not sure what it is before ending the recording. This video was put online and then pulled down a short time later. But of course, when you put things on the internet, um, they stay there forever. So, Adam Rajichka got his was put on waivers and has had his contract terminated for I would imagine looking like he's using drugs here. What are your thoughts on this? Well, disappointing to see that happen. Um, like uh, clearly... I think it's the right re response to the video. Oh, for sure, and you know it's lousy that he basically lit up his NHL career on that because I don't see another team giving him a shot like he he might come back if he has a successful year in Europe or two but I, I don't see anybody uh, offering him another contract and you know I mean just... he, he's been a very fringe NHLer as it is like I, I don't think anyone's going to be clamoring to bring him back into their organization because of that I think everybody has at least one Adam Rajichka. I think he can probably go back home or go over to Europe and play, but I, I think his NHL career is done at this point. Yeah, I agree. Like when I look at, you know, other fourth line centermen, Rajichka doesn't stand out as a guy I need to take a chance on. You know, much like um, the five players that got suspended earlier this season, like you, you're not going to see any of them you know, getting a contract immediately after the resolution of whatever you don't, most teams don't want, you know, bad headlines needlessly, uh, unless like the player is really good, in which case they go to Edmonton and, <laughs> you know, and that, but that's like, only for it, veterans. Yeah. And really disgraced NHLers. Like the only way I can see Rajishka coming back is if he goes to Europe and lights it up, if he just goes to Europe and becomes another European player, I don't think anybody calls him again. Like I re I'm looking at other fourth line guys around the league. Like, you know, Luke Glendening, I think yeah, I'd take over him. Sunquist, I'd take over him. Like pretty much every fourth line centerman, I think you would take over him or even your, your AHL guy, you take over him. Like I just, unless he, he tears it up and he's like the next Andre Kuzmenko over there. I don't think he'll ever be back. No, it just really bad. And it's not like he making. was looking great for the flames or the coyotes either. Like he's been inconsistent. He hasn't been a great, you know, player here. We've talked a lot about when he's good. He's good. When he's not, he's not. Yeah. I, I don't and know that he, he's, you know, I don't know that he would have been finding a job before training camp next year. Anyways. No, he likely would have been a training camp invite to insert miscellaneous team here with likely being in their AHL team to start the year and be like an injury call up. And yeah. Almost like your next stride and hunt. Yeah. And you know, I think that that you know, situation is gone for him and yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, like I said, disappointing, like you said as well, disappointing to see that, but 
I, no, I, especially like you know, as a person, like when we interviewed him at the development camp and all that, you know, like that was he was one of the nicer, more polite people that we dealt with, and you know, liked the guy and was rooting for him. Yeah, but, everybody, everybody you know, seems to like the guy. Just you know, it it just is frustrating. He made a mistake. When, He's a young man. He made a mistake, but when you're in the public eye, you know that mistakes are costly. Yeah, and it's just disappointing to see, you know, something like that be the narrative of, yep. you know, instead of just like the natural evolution of a player. I have a feeling this is probably the last time I'll ever mention his name. Probably. Um, well, a guy we thought we'd probably mention for the last time, who we haven't, is Mika Kiprasov. This Saturday, the 2nd of March, Mika Kiprasov will be back in Calgary. They finally convinced him to come back. As number 34 finally gets raised to the rafters, or technically not the rafters, the air vent, where they put all, yeah. the, <laughs> where they put all the banners these days. They're not even above the ice. It bothers me every time I'm in there. They're on an air vent off to the side of the ice. Um, but he'll be finally raised. There'll be a great ceremony. Um, I know, you know, the 80s team was before my time. Kipper, Jerome, those are my flames when I look back. So I'm glad to see another one of them going up there. I think everybody agrees, you know, this is well-deserved. He's getting in there a lot earlier than Chelios did, which I think says something as well. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. What, what's there not to like about this? And I think knowing the flames, there's no doubt they're going to do this right. Oh, for sure. You look at the Jerome Provided one. that they, you know, take gets the finish uh, scout guy for the flames you know to drag him to the airport and you know put the handcuffs on him to make sure that he can't run off <laughs> yep. and they actually get him there but we're going um, fishing where yes ice fishing yes um and you know i think <laughs> for a lot of these guys we hear in their interviews too matt their priorities change right now they're parents and their kids haven't seen them play and you know, coming back, like even Jerome said this, coming back, you know, having the kids there, letting the kids understand what dad's career was, was important to him at the time. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I'm sure that, well, like everybody that's a Flames fan admired everything that Kipper did on the ice. Like he was the best goaltender uh, right up there with Mike Vernon, um, you know, as the best goalies that have ever played for the flames and you know no matter how good or bad the team was like he gave the team a chance to win every single game i didn't think back in the day he would end his career as a flame like the flames were so bad for so many years i thought he'd won out yeah but you know and the flames did have a trade with him to going to toronto for a third round pick and in his final season he's like nah <laughs> so <laughs> you know and true Kiprasov fashion yeah that requires effort me <laughs> let me just finish up the year and i'm good yeah and i think at that time too you know he was probably calgary was his home i think his family i don't think ever lived here full time but you know why move somewhere else like you know you're you're done i can totally understand it and and i think you know i think it's great how often do we see guys in the modern nhl retire playing let's call it a whole career the you know the better part of his career for one team and retire there we yeah. didn't even see that with giordano no i don't know what will like, happen with backland we'll see true but yeah i'm excited for this you and i are both going to be in the building it's going to be a fun night if you're planning to go go on the calgary flames website they have information about what goes on when essentially doors open at five the jersey ceremony is at 6.30, and I think the game's at 8. So it's going to be not 6.20 to 8, but they got to resurface the ice and do all that sort of thing, take down the stage. But it'll probably be about an hour-long ceremony. And knowing what they did for Jerome's, it's going to be fun. You're going to see a lot of his teammates come talk. He's really close with Mike Vernon. Um, I, I'm just curious to see what Kipper looks like these days. Yeah. Is he, like, regressed into, like... Uh... Looking like Tormund Giants. Are, are we going to have the Kipper kid there? Is he going to be emulating his moves while he's on stage? Do you remember that kid? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Mika Kippersoff to me is still the goalie, and I think it's unfair, but he's still the goalie that we compare Flames goalies to. And I've heard people say, you know, Wolf is the next Kippersoff and things like that. And I imagine when Kippersoff came in, we were saying he was the next Vernon. Um, I don't think that's fair, but 
Kipper's made that legacy on this team. And yeah, well, and I think that, you know, like we saw like the passing of the torch from Lanny to Theo to Jerome, then uh, to Johnny Gaudreau and briefly Matthew Kachuk, you know, and like realistically, like the Flames had basically Mike Vernon, then nothing for a long period of time, then Mika Kippers off, and then again. nothing for a long period of time. Right, Obara so, and Brent yeah. Cron and guys like that. Danny Taylor. And, I think Cron was you know, before Kipper left, but yeah. Yeah, like uh, all sorts of, oh, okay, that was a guy who played here. Okay, I cool. think the probably <laughs> the most exciting goalie was Brathwaite, but I think he was even before Kipper. Yeah, he was from 99 to 2000. One, you know, and because uh, he got traded for Turk. That's right. Yeah, um, it's interesting to me too that of the we'll we'll take out the Forever Flame of the four jerseys that are retired, half of them are goalies. Yeah, you know, we've got number nine for Lanny, number twelve for Jerome, number thirty four for Kipper, number thirty for Vernon. Like, you know, I think it says something that we... Because there's a lot of teams that don't have many goalies retired. And even if we look at the Hall of Fame, not a lot of goalies in there. Um, I think it says something that Calgary's acknowledging those goalies. And that brings me to my next question for you. Do you think we'll see Kippersoff in the Hockey Hall of Fame? The only argument I can see against it uh, would be that uh, he did not have a long, long career. And he didn't get a but cup. He, yeah, but he did uh, win the Vesna. He did uh, set the modern-day goals against average. He did drag his team to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. You know, and, and he was probably Finland's best goaltender ever. So, If there's a Finnish know, Hockey Hall of Fame, he should be in there. Yeah, I think that, like, eventually he probably does in the same Bain that Mike Vernon did, but I don't think it would be anytime soon. I but. mean, the fact Vernon just got in, I think it's been realized that the Hockey Hall of Fame is short on goalies, and I think this year's nominations are trying to make up for that. And I wouldn't be surprised if the next three, four years of nominations are goalie heavy. I think if you look at the list of goalies not in there, Kipper's way down there. I don't think he's going to get any time in the next ten years if he gets in. Yeah. And I worry that by the time it's his turn, he's kind of forgotten about. Yeah. That's my well, and especially playing only for one team significantly, where he was a name yeah. player, and that team being Calgary, <laughs> frankly, you know, it's not like he was doing this for Toronto or you know, yep. Chicago or Boston or the exactly Canadians, like you know. Yeah. So, but he'll always he'll always live in our hearts here. It's been fun to watch some of the interviews the Calgary Flames are posting with former teammates and stuff. And I think it was Mark Giordano who said Kipper actually knew how to speak better English than he let on. He just didn't let anyone know, so he didn't have to do interviews. Well, if you had the choice not to talk to Eric Francis, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I, I think anybody. Like, you know, <laughs> I I think um, you know he just he wasn't that guy, right? No, and... And, I mean, there's other guys besides Francis, I know what you're saying, but, you know, Hockey Night in Canada does really good exposés, and, you know, he never really sat for one of those. No, and... And after hours. Yeah, he's just very much his own dude, and, you know, the random, you know, <laughs> guy that just... He was basically, like, the most non-athlete athlete, like, just regular guy. I wonder if and, he still smokes as much as he used to. Yeah. Where, you know, and he did not seem to give to him <clears throat> about any part of that aspect of it. I stopped pucks. That's it. See you later. <laughs> the other thing I, I found out today, that that there's all these stories about Kipper hanging out at the back alley nightclub. It's open again. And I checked their schedule. How do they not have like a Kipper after party? He might even show up. Yeah. <laughs> show up and poke a, smoke a pack in front of, you know. In front of back alley, like th they had exhibit there this weekend. It, nothing says old school like exhibit and Shaggy Two Dope is coming. Like you might as well have a Kipper night too. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was around. I didn't even realize exhibit was still around. <laughs> I guess he's done pimping rides. I don't know, but he came to Calgary for a concert. So like you know, that's K Kipper's legendary at the back alley. They should be having some sort of after party. Yeah, but it's gonna be a lot of fun, and I'm glad. 
Kipper's getting that chance. And I'm glad Kipper's, you know, kids are getting that chance. They probably weren't old enough to remember, um, you know, to remember dad play. And I, I think, you know, we want them to see how much we love their dad. Yeah. He doesn't, it's not like he's even played in flames, old timer games or anything like that. Like, I don't know if they've ever seen him, you know, play competitively. I don't know what he's doing over in Finland if he plays anything, but you know, we, we haven't seen him suit up for like one of the, you know, the, the, uh, legends games at the outdoor games or anything like that. So really since he left Calgary, as far as I know, he hasn't played any significant games. No. Um, you see pictures all the time of some guy played a legends game over in Finland. We haven't seen any of that. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense. Like he was very focused on his job and that was, you know, his job. And then, you know, everything else It's like, I'm, I'm living my life. And that's Bye. interesting too. Cause you know, hockey, so many of these guys can't get out of hockey when they, you know, when they retire, they got to be coaches or GMs or scouts. And he seems to have been able to just walk away from the game. Yep. Just so. do his own thing. So it'll be a lot of fun if you uh, if you want tickets. There's still tickets available. I'm just on the Calgary Flames website. They actually have a, a pack right now where you can get tickets this game and you get another game for free. This is a game I think you want to be at. Like as a Flames fan, I was going to do whatever I could to make sure I was in the dome for that game. This is one that you you're going to regret if you miss. Just like the Jerome game. I was so happy I, I was able to be there because. That's the kind of thing that, you know, you're you're not going to see again. And I don't think we're going to have players as impactful as these guys for a while. Hopefully, it's going to be a long time till Wolf has to retire. So, you know, you don't want to miss these pieces of history, especially for where the team is going right now. It's sort of on that downward trend, I think it's awesome that we can have that historical piece and celebrate greatness. Yep. Um, but between now and then, Matt, there's only two games. We've got uh, two games this week. I've said this for a number of weeks. I, every week I go, wow, here's the perfect opportunity to make some trades. And they haven't happened yet. But there's only two games this week. Perfect time to make so, trades. So, you know, because we're opposites the last few weeks, let's say that they're not going to make This any is a terrible time all. to make a trade. How dare you make a trade and offstage Mika Kippersoff? How dare you, Conroy? Yes, This is exactly. your buddy. The whole week should be about him. Rabble, rabble. There you go. <laughs> we should have... Our mayor, no Jody Gondek, declared Mika Kippersoff Day, and nothing shall get in the way of that. Um, yes. Anyway, two <laughs> two games. on. They have a couple days off here on Tuesday. They will play at home the LA Kings at 7 p.m., and then they're off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they play again that Saturday game at 8 p.m. against... And it's weird. You think that the Kippersoff game would have been against the Sharks or something, but it's against the Pittsburgh Penguins on Saturday the 2nd. Yeah, and you know, it'll be nice to see Sydney back in the building. Uh, I think this is what his sixth or seventh time in Calgary only. You think he does he for whatever you think reason Coleman's like, gonna go after him? He'll become the well, new legend killer. Yeah. Well, as long as one of the penguins doesn't run the goalie, I think they're fine. <laughs> and if they do run the goalie, I, I wonder if we can have Kipper as the e bug that night. Yeah. <laughs> that would actually be pretty funny if they enlisted Kipper as the e-bug for that night until he's got to go in against us and we learn he can still s stop pucks. Then that wouldn't be as funny. Um, Mika Kippersoff posts a shutout for that's right. the Pittsburgh Penguins. What the? <laughs> that's right. No, maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> not as good an idea. No. <laughs> So t last week, you and I didn't do well with our predictions. I thought we'd win against Boston, lose to Winnipeg Edmonton. You thought we'd lose all three. Matt, two games this week. What are you going with? I'm going to say they are going to lose them both. <laughs> Tactically. All right. That's your, your strategic guess. Yes. Because when, when you've said they're going to win all three, they lose all three. And you say they're going to lose all three, they win all three. Yes. They better win Saturday. Like... You better win that game. If, yeah. if there's only one you win, it better be the Kippersoft game. Well, it, it's one of those things where around the league, anytime that like there's a jersey retirement thing, for whatever reason, most of the time the team that's hosting that event loses, and it's like only like they only win like twenty five to thirty percent of the time. So yeah, I've heard all sorts of theories about that. The guys are sitting on the bench for too long and don't. But it's like both teams are doing that. So, yeah. so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's just one of those weird things. So, 
Hopefully this is one of the one and four aspects instead of the three and four. <laughs> All right, Matt, I'm going to go completely the opposite because it seems to be you that's more jinx than me. I'm going to say that we win both. Okay, so after this week, we went <laughs> one and one. <laughs> that, that's exactly what's going to happen, right? We're going to lose to LA. We're going to... Ah! You're right. This will be our this will be our litmus test. Yeah. Who is more cursed? <laughs> That's right. So I'm going to say we win both. You say we're going to lose both. Maybe we cancel them out. Maybe we, I don't know, we can't tie them both. That's not possible. Um, maybe we go deep in a shootout for both. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but it should be a fun week. Enjoy, I guess, a bit of a lighter schedule as we head towards that Kiprasov game and towards the deadline. And I would not be surprised with a three-day gap there if something happens. Well, and realistically, there not being a ton of games between now and the trade deadline does nothing but benefit Four us, games. frankly. Yeah, because of the fact that, um, you know, less chance for players to get injured and, yeah, and more time for the, those deals to actually And usually manifest. if we look back, we see that there's one big deal done kind of the week before the deadline. Like, you know, when I think back to bi to previous deadlines, there is that one like six, seven days out where you go, huh, okay, I guess we're open for business. I think that's going to be the Flames this year. Well, and the thing is, is that the Flames are basically the only seller of note um, where like the best Yeah, I, I think the Flames players the have to go tender. first bef before the market opens up. Yeah, because like, like everybody, the gold everybody wants the Flames guys and then it's going to be, okay, you didn't get them. What's your consolation prize? Well, and you look at, like, uh, the defensemen, like, the two best guys by a mile are Hannafin and Tanev, and then it's, like, filler guys after that. Like, there's no real depth, so, you know, if you're looking to add a good defenseman, there's only one team that has them available, and the two goaltenders that are available on the market are Markstrom and Soros, and Soros is looking like a average backup, not really a starter, even though he has been. Um, like he's been supplanted and lost his job in Nashville. So he's not looking like the real solution for any of the handful of teams needing goaltender either. So like, it, you know, Calgary is firmly in the driver's seat with all of those things. So. And if I was the GM and I applied for the job, didn't get the call. Um, <laughs> but if I was the GM, I think we both did. <laughs> neither of us got the call, Matt. They said that no. there's too good a chemistry. We can't break it up and we can't hire them both. So let's just leave them doing the podcast. Um, yeah. I would actually think it's advantageous to bring somebody in now to get them acquainted with the team at home and during a, a down week, like a week yeah. without a lot of games. I wouldn't want someone to join me, say that because the Flames play on either side of the, the trade deadline, um, the seventh against Tampa in Tampa, Saturday at, right afterwards in Florida matinee game. I wouldn't want somebody to meet me on the road. I'd rather bring in a guy now, give him the week without a lot of games, get used to the Calgary fan base, get acquainted with us at home, and then go on the road with them. So if it was me, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's why they didn't call me. Um, but I would... I would say this is probably the ideal time to get done. Like you said, I think other teams are going to be pushing them to get this deal done and open that market up. Yeah, because realistically, there's probably eight to ten teams that are wanting those three guys. And, you know, it, it's one of those where, you know, everybody's competing against each other for the same finite asset. And a couple so. of those teams, I think, are going to want more than one asset, more than just our defensemen. So they probably want to know if this is done so they know how much they've got to keep shopping with. Exactly. So I, I'm, my, I have a strong feeling it'll happen this week. Yeah. Where do you put but Dan? It certainly won't. Rabble, rabble. Where do you put Dan <laughs> Vladar? Um, on, on the, the bench. bench. Yeah, on the bench. I think we need to rename him. We're going to call him Dan Vadar because the L belongs to his opponents. <laughs> After that Edmonton game, I think he's deserved that one. So yep. um, this week, you think the L belongs with him on the bench? I think you're right. I think the Flames right now, I mean, pending Markstrom's healthy and apparently wasn't 100% for the Edmonton game, which is why Vladar went in. But pending Markstrom's healthy, I think, yeah, it's got to be Markstrom. Yeah, and realistically, over the next two weeks, like until either the trade deadline hits or Markstrom's elsewhere, I think Markstrom just plays. 
Just I agree. Because... After the deadline, if he's still here, I think you'd probably go more of a 50-50 or even a 60-40 in favor of Vladar. Well, I, I think if he's still here, then it's like trying to have your cake and eat it too. Like I would have would assume that Hanif and Tanev are gone at that point. So it's like, okay, well, those guys might be gone, but we're going to still push for the playoffs. So you probably ride Markstrom for a bit until you fall out. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Well, we'll see what happens over the next week, Matt, and I will see you uh, at the Dome. We'll be in the Dome chilling with probably Jerome, but also Kipper on yeah. Saturday night. <laughs> I would assume Jerome would he be He better there. be there. It's like, oh, screw that he, guy. I mean, I you know, if anybody from that team can talk, it's <laughs> Jerome. He's going to give a speech. We know that. And Conroy. And McLennan. You know, That's why they're like, giving like us an hour the, for this whole thing to take off. I know. it. it Kipper's only going to talk for like 30 seconds. Oh, thank you for that. Okay, Thank you for a great honor. Here. Go Flames, and away he goes. Yep. Um, but yeah, no. Why was this an hour and a half? <laughs> oh, Conroy and McClellan. Oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> I've added those tell Connie it starts at noon, and he's sitting there talking, and nobody's in the building. <laughs> yep. But anyway, we'll be in the Dome, chilling with Jerome on, uh, <laughs> on Saturday, and I will potentially see you there, and we will talk again on Sunday about whatever happens this week. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.